Hello and welcome to Best Books, a podcast from Orchardville Church that helps you choose your next book. I'm your host, Jonathan Thede, and uh, we here at Best Books are really passionate about helping you choose your next book to, to help you uh, weave through the resources that are available to us. You know, there's so many different books, so many opportunities to read in only 24 hours a day. Uh, so today we'll be looking at a book specifically on prayer, but first let me introduce our guest for, for, for the month. Uh, this episode's guest is uh, a passionate former Arkansas resident. Please welcome to the show for episode six, Bryce Vaught. Bryce, how's it going? Man, very well. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this episode specifically. I get to uh, kind of talk about one of my favorite books that I've, I've gone through. Um, and so it's, it's just a pleasure to be here and just to have some conversations. So Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for, for coming on. Yeah. I'd love to just start off by telling us a little bit more about yourself, your family, how, how you got to Orchard Hill Church. Yeah, yeah. So I probably shared with some of you, but I uh, was born and raised in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Arkansas Razorback through and through, bleed, bleed that Arkansas red, and uh, uh, moved up here in February of this year after graduating seminary last May May of 22, and I uh, was on staff at the church I was born and raised in, but just felt like I was in a season where both my wife and I felt like we were just in a season of change, and mm -hmm. came across a position here at Orchard Hill, and after visiting with the staff, it just felt like this was the right move at the right time, and God has just been so faithful to lead lead this transition, to make it really as smooth as possible. I mean, it, it's a big move, 14 hours away from home, and right. yet God has has constantly been going before us, making it easy, enjoyable, and um, we're just really glad to be here. I feel like this is the place we need to be at this time, and looking forward to what lies ahead. So, Yeah, given your background, it's fair to say that you wouldn't make this decision carelessly or, yeah. or thoughtlessly, and so I'm curious given your role with adult ministry and men and married couples, maybe just talk to us about a, a challenge that, that, that you can see in your role and, and then maybe also an opportunity. Yeah, I think, um, and one challenge is just uh, coming into really from a church that was a lot smaller and then to a church that's already got, you know, a, a big structure, calendars already full, just really having an idea of, of what can we do for men's ministry, men's events, and really figuring out timing-wise of when things can happen and how that can fit in the rhythm of the season of Orchard Hill, which mm -hmm. really kind of does take about a year to, to understand the rhythm of everything that happens here. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got Kids Fest and holiday services and then uh, everything that takes place with the groups and the different seasonal studies that we have. So Really this year, I've just been approaching it to where I just want to meet people. I want to mm -hmm. just immerse myself in the rhythm of Orchard Hill and get to know how I can best serve and, and be an asset to the church as, as uh, just want to be fruitful where I'm at. And I think God's doing that and looking forward to what's to come. So Yeah, I, I think um, you have a unique opportunity in that you're, you're in charge of, of men's ministry. And so I know you, you moved and then your wife moved a couple months later and both yeah. times you had you had a lot of guys helping you move. Yeah. So do you do you feel like you sort of have the monopoly in the church on helping people move? You know, you, yes. You have the relationships in place. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind you're of... You're the guy to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's typical in church. Like even at the last church I was mm -hmm. on staff at, we had a running joke that we were three pastors in a truck. It was like <laughs> yeah. anytime somebody totally. needed to move furniture or something, yeah. like we were getting the first call. And knowing that I was going to move here and we had these, you know, a big truck of a lot of stuff to unload, I was like, I don't want to be that guy to ask, but yeah. you need help. I totally. mean, we, we couldn't do it by ourselves. And it was just such a blessing. I mean, every time when I moved up first, you know, we had about five or six guys meet us at the apartment, had everything unloaded within about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then same thing when we moved my wife up. There were about, I think, eight men that met us at the apartment, had everything out of the truck really quick. And just such a blessing to be a part of that and you know look forward to seeing how I can you know join in and be a part of the moving company yeah, so, totally. yeah. well I wasn't even involved in those moves but it was such an encouragement to me when we were talking in the lobby one day and someone you know comes up to you and, mm -hmm. it's, and, and everyone the same question you know do you need help do you need yeah. help moving and I think uh, in the best of cases a church is like a family but in mm -hmm. the worst of cases the church calls itself a family, but doesn't actually act like a family. Yeah. So I think it was it was encouraging to me that that at least at Orchard Hill, it's it's mm -hmm. been a it's been a family, and yeah. to be able to come alongside you, um, like that. Yeah. 
since today's topic is, is prayer and both of us are pretty big sports fans, I just mm -hmm. want to start off with like more of a goofy question. Uh, have you ever found yourself like praying for an Arkansas victory? Yes. Really? Uh, I mean, really? Yeah, I don't even hesitate. Okay. I, I think specifically back to when uh, the Razorback, the baseball team, we were in the College World Series. We, I mean, we just had to win two games. Yeah. And we won the first game, and that second game is, is like, it's a heartbreak. Just We, we were up in the ninth inning. Yeah. We had two outs. We were up a run. All we needed to make was one catch, mm -hmm. and there's a pop-up. It's a uh, foul ball. We had three Arkansas players right there ready oh, to catch God. it and win the World Series. They All three watch it hit the ground. The next play, the next pitch, the guy hits a hit. They take the lead, yeah. and then they win the next game, and yeah. we don't even uh, – So I, but I was praying that season. Like, I just wanted a championship so yeah. bad for our coach and – I would always try to mask it, you know, like, oh, this would be really good spiritually for our community. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not the case. So. Do you think someone else is just praying harder? Yeah, I guess you? so. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. There must have been a, a somebody on the other team. Yeah. That, more Disclaimer, spiritual. it's not yeah. a prayer work. It's, we want no, it, yeah. It to be. yeah. We'll talk about that in a second. Right. But, um, yeah, like I said, we're, we're going to talk about the topic of prayer by, by looking at this book that's right in front of you on YouTube. If you're listening, the, the book is called Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? by Philip Yancey. Uh, prayer is one of those things that is so essential in the Christian life, yet mm -hmm. it, it can be overlooked from time to time. It's easy to devalue it over time. It's so important, but in our most honest moments, a lot of us feel like we're just not very good at it, yeah. or at least we're not very consistent. So yeah. I want to start by asking you, you know, what, what has been your journey with prayer? Do you feel like it comes naturally to you at all? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, I'll have to start by saying that I grew up in church, you know, I, I'm blessed with a family that has a legacy just of faith and um, just really grounded in, in uh, Christianity and, and what they taught and how they displayed that in my life. So I think from a young age, I had a healthy understanding of prayer. I, you know, despite, I was kind of kidding when I was saying I was praying for the Razorbacks <laughs> to win, um, you know, that I was hopeful, but you know, whatever. But I, yeah. I think I had a mature respect for prayer. And even when I was in grade school, I remember having this conviction that I that prayer was important. It was essential to the life of a Christian. And so even without really being prompted or told, like I, I wanted to have a discipline of praying every day. And so I would do that before bed. And it kind of just became a part of my routine. I did that for years with, with nobody really telling me. Mm -hmm. But then... Uh, Part of my story is that once I graduated high school, I really began to struggle with my faith. I just saw some areas of my life that were inconsistent with really what I knew to be true and right. I had a lot of questions of why we, you know, why I believed what I believed. And in that season, I really struggled with prayer. I felt like God was displeased with me. I felt like I couldn't communicate with Him. I felt kind of like a hypocrite in a lot of ways. And in that season, prayer was not natural. It, I really struggled and um, really just began to seek God through His Word. And uh, over the course of time, even from that point on, even when I did begin to gain an understanding of what Christianity was about, I, I think I still struggled with prayer. Mm -hmm. And when I even came into ministry, I had this conviction that prayer was going to be essential to just performing in ministry, but just, you know, staying confident in ministry, staying rooted in who Christ is and who I am. And, you know, it's it's been up and down. I, I It's not natural all the time. Sometimes there's a joy and an ease about it, but you have to really work at it. And I think that's, that's part of what um, is the journey of prayer. God invites us to work. I think Paul said, labor with me in mm -hmm. prayer, that there is some work involved and you know, just pursuing God, um, he, he calls us to, to want it, to want Him, you know, to, no matter what it costs us, whether we have to work for it or whether it comes easy, He, he wants us to seek Him with all that we have. So, Yeah, absolutely. I, I really resonate with that story because I think, from my experience, prayer is almost easier when you're a kid. There's yeah. just, um, the, less, the less you know about it sometimes, the, the yes. easier it becomes. Yeah. Um, no one really has to give you guidelines of what to pray for. You just mm -hmm. talk to God like like He's in the room with you. Yeah. And um, sometimes, the uh, sadly, you know, the more that you find out about something, it can, it can create this 
formality or formalism right. and, and to how, how you pray. And so I still struggle with that. Sometimes yeah. I'm, I'm praying and halfway through, I'm like, do you talk like this? You yeah, know, why, yeah. why, why, what, what is this language? You mm-hmm. know, why are you, why are you, why are you using dictionary words to talk to right. the God of the universe? Yeah. You know? And, um, one of my favorite, uh, Psalms, I think it's, I think it's Psalm 106, but it just, it just talks about, the Psalm starts with, Lord, I love you because you hear my prayer. Mm. And sometimes I just try to, try to just isolate that verse and think about that. Think about how crazy yeah. it is that, that he's listening, that we, mm-hmm. we, we have his ear. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that's so cool. But to my question, you know, we often uh, devalue prayer. It can be yes. easy to, over time, to um, our, our self-sufficiency starts yeah. to kick in. Yeah, absolutely. We can feel like maybe it's not working, or like you said, we, we feel like we're not very good at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because we're not very good at it, it's just not very effective in our life. And mm-hmm. so we tend to begin to just to rely on our own self, our own understanding, and our own effort. And it's a challenge, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, as I said, today we'll be discussing the book Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference by Philip Yancey. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we won't be able to cover the, the whole book. Uh, but this is actually a good thing because we'll cover enough to, to allow you as the listener to decide if this book is, is worth seeking out. And I'll just say up front that I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. I'd love for everyone listening this to this to, to invest in this book and to read uh, at, at least a few of the five parts. Um, the book is divided into five parts. Today we'll be dis- dis- discussing just the, the, the first two. Uh, Bryce, how I like to start these discussions is by trying to boil the book down into just a few seconds. Uh, mm-hmm. And so um, I'm going to be honest, I, I got a ton of this book, but as I prepared for it, I sort of struggled to, to find a, a crystal clear thesis statement. Yeah. Uh, but my observation is that the author is, tr- is writing out of his own humanity and his own mm-hmm. questions uh, about prayer. You know, he continually touches on these two extremes of prayer, one that treats God like like a servant essentially making requests and nothing else, there's no relationship, mm-hmm. and the other that says prayer changes the person more than the circumstances. Yeah. And it seems that Yancey takes issue with both approaches, and so he asks the question, does, does prayer make any difference? Mm-hmm. You know, he kind of is bold enough to say, hey, I, I'm glad that prayer changes me, but shouldn't mm-hmm. it also change my circumstances? Yeah. Um, since you've read the whole book, I just wanted to see if this le- thesis lined up with your experience and what you remembered. From yeah, the book. yeah, and I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because if you're not familiar with Philip Yancey, he's a very accomplished author. I mean, he's written a lot of good books, and uh, I mean, he's a professional writer. He's a very prolific writer and dynamic writer. But this book in particular is pretty unique, even among among his writing. It's um, I think he even says from the outset that he is not an expert on prayer. Mm-hmm. He's not writing to try to prove necessarily a, a grand point on prayer. He's right. really even writing this book out of his own research and interest and his own questions. I think he says at one point that he considers himself a pilgrim, that he wants to approach this kind of like a journalist, and he, he's researching and listening. He's listening to the fears and frustrations of people who struggle with prayer. But one thing I really appreciate about Yancey is he has this deep conviction that prayer is essential. Like mm-hmm. it is po- important, it does make a difference, but what difference does it make? Mm-hmm. And I think he does say this pretty early on, and I think this is kind of, you know, he goes back to this thought throughout the book that really prayer makes a difference because prayer at its basic understanding is just keeping company with God. Mm-hmm. and. Prayer makes a difference because God is the ultimate difference. You know, God makes a difference in our circumstances, but He also makes a difference in us. And that prayer is the difference. Mm-hmm. And so I think He kind of goes back to that, but He's not afraid to kind of wade into the weeds a little bit and just mm-hmm. really deal with some difficult subjects in prayer that we all struggle with and have questions with, but sometimes we don't have the words or even the understanding of how to voice those concerns or frustrations. But he does a great job of kind of addressing some of those issues throughout the book. So yeah, absolutely. I, I think his writing style is is unique in that he sometimes he writes very provocatively, not mm-hmm. not to say that it's like inappropriate or anything. Yeah. But but he, but like you say, the way he phrases things sometimes it's like, wow, I've always had this question, but mm-hmm. I actually didn't know I yeah. had the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know in one part of the book, I think it's part three or four, he talks about. You know more of the provocative topics like how, you know, unanswered prayer. You know yes. what what happened in that situation, mm-hmm. um, situations that that breaks our hearts, and it's sort of we question. You know, God, where were you? If mm-hmm. we're praying, why didn't you do anything about yeah. it? 
Um, and so, I, as I said, the author breaks down the book into five parts, each consisting of about five chapters each. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to pick up this book and just read the first part, it's very accessible, uh, only about five chapters mm -hmm. per part. In part one, he talks about prayer as keeping company with God, as Bryce was just talking about. In part two, he moves to this tension of wondering if prayer makes a difference. And, mm -hmm. and that was probably my favorite part, just yeah. kind of gets down to the meat of the title. Yeah. Uh, in part three, he talks about the language of prayer, in which I'm sure he gets practical. Mm -hmm. In part four, he touches on some of the common dilemmas. There it is. It was part four. In which, yeah. Yeah. And then in part five, he talks about the practice of prayer, which again, I'm sure is is, is very practical. Yeah. Uh, Bryce, I know you and I have talked about how much we enjoy Yancey's writing style, mm -hmm. um, the way he goes about making his arguments. So how would you describe the author's writing style? Yeah, um, I think he describes himself this way in this book, but I've also uh, read where he describes himself this way in another some of his other writing, but he, he really considers himself a pilgrim in mm -hmm. the way that he writes and researches, is that he can, he's not an expert. He, he wants to be contemplative. He's mm -hmm. not in a hurry to find the answer. He wants to, he wants to like lift up every rock and see what's underneath and mm -hmm. figure out, is there any hidden gem that we're missing before just settling on, you know, an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd say he's very exploratory, but he's also very inviting. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he's just, he wants you to come along with him in this journey. As I said, he's kind of a pilgrim and just wants to explore and, uh, you know, look and, you know, contemplate and see what's out there. And so it, it, at times it may feel like, man, he's just not getting to an answer. But I think one reason I was so drawn to this book was I, I read this book first while I was in seminary. I had mm -hmm. you know, read one of his other books for a class and was really impressed with the way he wrote. But of course, in seminary, you're reading a lot of academic books where people are trying to prove a point and they, they have an idea, a thesis statement already in mind. Sure. And I think when I read this book at the time, it was just refreshing to hear someone who said, I don't really have an answer, and I just want to explore, and I want to wait, and I want to invite God to lead me, to change me, to correct me, and I want to make sure I have this right, because knowing who God is and how to live life with Him is the most important thing that He can discover. Mm -hmm. And so He's just hes kind of a pilgrim. He's yeah. going to just go explore, kind of be a nomad, and... Mm -hmm you know, learn as he goes. So. Yeah. I'm curious. There's these, um, these little s mini snapshot stories. They don't always have anything to do with what he's currently talking about, but yeah. I think he just includes them as, hey, here's an example of someone who, I, I think the story is usually they had a thought about God, mm -hmm. something happened in their life, they went to Scripture, and they were mind blown to, yeah. to find out, oh, what my, my preconceived notions about prayer actually weren't true. Did you, mm -hmm. did you read any of those? I did. I the first time I read this book, I don't think I read all of them. Mm -hmm. But then the second time I went through this book, it's like, I, I need to go through this a little bit more slowly. Yeah. And so I started reading some of those you know, side stories that he included. And man, some of those were really profound as well. Yeah. Um, and I think he just pulled those in because a lot of his book, a lot of the content that he you know, used for this book came from conversations he had with people who were struggling, yeah. who had questions with prayer, who didn't have answers to prayer. And mm -hmm. as he met with people who came up with answers, he included their content into the stories. And some of them are emails that he you know, received from people and, or just stories that he stumbled across from people. But they, I think they were just as helpful as some of the stuff that he wrote as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember we were talking about this book a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in the offices, and something we were talking about is that a lot of times theological books have a certain rhythm to them, a certain yeah. language around them, to the point where I remember early on in, in ministry, I, I, you sort of learn the language, you learn yeah. the lingo, and, and the the downside of that is we all sort of start to sound the same. Yeah, um, and I think something significant about I didn't even know Yancey was a like a prolific writer, like you were saying, yeah. but that makes a lot of sense because he comes to this book already having a voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really refreshing for me where it didn't seem like he was trying to be anyone. Yeah. He was trying to be himself and talk about prayer. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, um, he might disagree with us, but he doesn't really come across like he's trying to even make a point, really. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It's, it's, I think to your point, it's he's a pilgrim and he's trying to get across, hey, I'm, I'm in this with you and I mm -hmm. have these same questions and I want to 
I want to be a resource where yeah. we're a safe place to ask those questions. Yeah, and that is very much a part of his story and the faith as well. Mm-hmm. He grew up in a very, very um, fundamentalist, almost spiritually toxic and abusive church okay. to the point where he even left the faith for a time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I wrote this quote down somewhere, but he says that he... Um, He calls himself, he says, I'm a pilgrim recovering from a bad church upbringing, searching for a faith that makes its followers followers larger and not smaller. Mm. And so uh, he's he's written some books also just about wrestling with the idea of suffering and having faith through suffering. And so, yeah, a lot of his books just come out of his own struggles and his own questions and frustrations. And turns out, I think they're shared by a lot of people and they just haven't been voiced or really talked about very well. And he's, he's a really safe voice. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he wants to represent who Jesus is, as meek, as gentle, as lowly, and mm-hmm. inviting. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, getting more into the, the meat of the book, did, were there any helpful chapters or sections that, that you remember of, hey, this was, this, was, uh, this was a snapshot of the book that I really yeah. felt helpful? Yeah, um, the first chapter that comes to mind, this chapter really stuck out the first time I read through the book. In fact, I think I recommended this chapter to a friend. I, he, mm. I knew he didn't have time to read the whole book, but I was like, hey, just read this one chapter. And I, it's chapter, um, I think it's chapter six. Yeah, okay. it's chapter six. And it's really the, the point of it is looking at the, the prayer life of Jesus. Mm. Um, he, I think he makes this statement at one point in the book. He says, if, if I can summarize the question of like, why pray? If I had to give one answer to that question of why pray as a believer, he says it's because Jesus did. Mm. I and mean, if if anybody shouldn't have to pray, it'd be Jesus. Right. <laughs> like yeah. he, but he he often even just left his ministry and what he was doing at the time to to just be in God's presence. And mm-hmm. I love the story he presented towards the end of that chapter. That is like he he sh- remembers the time that Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, mm-hmm. and he says, as an onlooker, if you were to see him struggling in prayer. Mm-hmm in that moment, and you knew what was ahead, you'd be thinking to yourself, man, this guy's never going to make it. I mean, he's, he's weak. He's just crying out with fear. But it, then Yancey brings out to the point, but as soon as Jesus stands up from prayer, he is the most composed character throughout the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is kind of scrambling to figure out what's happening, but Jesus is in full control. Mm-hmm. And really, it's that place of prayer that gives him this quiet confidence for the, for the rest of his life, for the ministry and the call that, that he lived out. And so I, I think that chapter, more than anything, gave me a confidence in my own prayer life. Um, because I, I'll be honest, there was a season where I was struggling in prayer, and I'd read other books on prayer, but it just seemed like the authors just tried to create a formula for prayer that was encouraging for a moment, but then just kind of left me frustrated. Yeah. still. And just Yancey's book really gave me confidence. Say, it's okay to struggle with prayer. And mm-hmm. Jesus struggled through prayer, and yet he, he valued it so highly. Yeah. As his followers, we should too. Yeah. So, I, I think it's interesting you bring up the formulas of prayer. I, I, I Formulas in certain churches can hold a lot of weight or yeah. no weight at all. So uh, how, how, how do you see that? How do you see formulas? Like what, what what place do they have in our mm. prayer lives? And, and um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's both. As, as you said, there's some tr- uh, Christian traditions who would say, you know what, we, we don't need any type of formula in the way we relate with God. It's very spontaneous. Yeah. It's very... Extemporary. Spir- yes, yeah. and then there's other traditions that would say, no, we, we don't need to have anything like that. We need to be rigid and we need mm. to follow a set pattern. And I, I don't think it needs to be either or. I think it needs to be both. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are certain times where formulas and liturgy, written prayers, have really grounded me. When I didn't have words and I, I didn't really know how to communicate what I was feeling, and just reading a written prayer can be powerful. Mm-hmm. But those written prayers and those times, those formulas, I think really do help you to become more spontaneous. Yeah and extemporaneous in your prayer life as, mm-hmm. as you begin to lean into those and trust that God really is with you. So Yeah, I think there's an irony in there because I think some people would, in the non-denominational church space, interdenominational, would, would balk at the idea of praying a, a, a liturgy or a set mm-hmm. prayer. But if you really press them on it, they say, 
what I always pray through the Acts prayer, like yeah, adoration, yeah. confession, and, and it's really it's 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 a more modern version of, of right. that, or or, or, I, or I always pray uh, in the spirit of the Lord's prayer, and so yeah. I, I, I like your perspective on it. That I think for some seasons it's extremely helpful. Mm-hmm. I, I know in seasons for myself when I am just struggling with it, when I'm. I have no form to it. I think the Acts prayer is so helpful yeah. to, to start with adoration, to mm-hmm. uh, to express to God how great He is, and then sort of ask Him for for, for my my needs. But yeah. and there's other times where, man, that that it just does not feel realistic to me. Yeah. It does not feel like a child would approach his father and right. say, "Dad, you're so great." Mm-hmm. And then uh, you know sometimes it's just like I need this, you know. Yeah. And and that's that's our that's our privilege as his children to be yeah. able to to come to Him um, mm-hmm. like like prodigals, you know. Yeah. Um, Wow. Yeah, I, I, I think I think this book was really valuable because it shows the the freedom that we have in prayer. Yeah. And I don't know if you, you picked that up at all. Yes, he, he really does just kind of invite you in to, to experience that freedom, to know that it's okay to not have all the answers. It's mm-hmm. okay to really even be angry in, yeah. in your prayer life and to be frustrated with the intimacy that you long for God, that you, you can just feel like it's not there. And that's okay. It's, yeah. That's kind of part of this journey. And, you know, I think God allows us to struggle in mm-hmm. prayer because there's not a set formula that we just get an answer every time because he's not a magician. He's not right. your servant. He's God of the universe. Right. And so you just, you show up, you, you keep praying because mm-hmm. he's there, you know, and you just trust that. And sometimes you get this really sweet glimpse of who he is mm-hmm. and what he's capable of. And then other times he just gives you just enough to just to keep wanting more, yeah. and you know. So it's it's a beauty. It's it's a relationship that we're called into, and I think Yancy really picks that up and presents that pretty well. So yeah, it's funny that the 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 person of God, being that he is he's a person, he's not a computer. Mm. It's both the most attractive aspect of biblical Christianity, and and if we're honest as Christians, it can be the biggest drawback. Absolutely, because, because yeah. I think in our in our selfishness we want. We want expected results, yes. especially in in the twenty first century, where, man, if 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 I if I go to Walmart and they don't have something on the shelves, I have a right to complain. Yeah. With God, we don't have that right. right. It's, it, that's not the relationship. We don't come on 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 equal foot. But mm-hmm. God and His grace allows us children to 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 bend His ear to us and yeah. to and to to actually listen to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I have just one more question before we sort of transition. Um, into Orchard Hill specific mm-hmm. questions, um, and and that is when it comes to like praying through the Psalms or maybe like the Valley of Vision. Do do, do you ever do you ever use those kinds of resources in your prayer life? Yeah, m- probably not so much at first. Um, you know, I think I've shared this uh, with somebody. I grew up in a Pentecostal, very charismatic yeah. tradition, and within that tradition, it's. It's very much against like, hey, we're gonna not going to use any liturgy. Sure. Okay. And so I think at first, whenever I was you know learning to pray and wanting to grow in my spiritual life, I I didn't really rely on that. Mm-hmm. But since I've uh, grown and matured, I've I've seen the value of just holding on to God's word and praying through Scripture, um, even if it's just you know repeating and like uh, rephrasing Scripture. It, it gives me a handle to hold on to, and it gives me a starting point, especially in those seasons where you don't know how to pray. You don't really have the words to describe what you're feeling or what you're going through or what you're even ho- even hoping for. And so it's a good starting point, and sometimes God uses that to help me to understand and discern a little bit more, and I can I can pray a little bit more freely. And but um, it's, it's a great tool, and it's just God's gift to us to help us to communicate with Him as He has communicated with us as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have to talk about the book, but I just have a few questions as we wrap up. Thinking about Orchard Hill Church and, mm-hmm. and, and how we can help people with this book. Um, so the first question is just simply, you know, who, who is this book for? Yeah, I would say this book is for those who are really frustrated in their prayer life Mm. um you know it or maybe maybe frustrated is too strong of a word if you're in a season where your your prayer life just seems kind of stuck or stagnant or maybe you just have some questions this would be a great resource um it's 
as I said, it's really encouraging. He's not trying to prove a point. He's just trying to invite you in to explore, to consider what prayer is and what the value of it is. And so if you're really struggling or if you have questions and you're just even new to prayer, this mm-hmm. would be a great, great place to start. So, mm-hmm. My other question is, um, I know for some more sensitive topics, when someone's really going through something, it can be difficult to hand someone a book because they're yeah. right in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think this is a book where someone could read it in, in the middle of a crisis, or would you, would you, would you more recommend? Hey, you should you should get this theology of prayer before you go into yeah, some I, sort of crisis. I would say this one is a good one in the midst of crisis. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend every book in the midst of crisis. I think sometimes you just need to go through it. But sure. Yancey, as I said, he's he's very inviting to say, you know what, this is really hard and I don't have all the answers and I, I don't know why you haven't experienced an answer to prayer. And sometimes prayer feels like it, it's not working and it's okay. So he just, like I said, he just invites you along for the journey. And so for those who are struggling or in the midst of a season where, man, you're just in darkness, this would be a great place to maybe find some comfort and grace because he he writes with just a lot of gentleness and meekness, and it's it's enjoyable. I always feel kind of a sense of calm when I read through this book, and just a good source of grace and comfort to know that God cares, mm-hmm. and He's with me. Whether I believe it, feel it, acknowledge it, He's there. Yeah. So. And I think it, it it's only appropriate to sort of give a plug to our church staff as a whole, because... Um, we, we, what we don't want to say is that if you're going through a crisis, hey, just just read a book. Yeah. Um, you, you, you need people in your life. Right. You need people to come alongside you. So if, you, if you're listening to this and you're going through something and you need to talk to someone about it, um, we're always open as, as staff mm-hmm. members throughout the week. And then we also have a, a wonderful counseling center that, that these people would love nothing more than to, to hear you out and to walk alongside you through, through this crisis. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's all the time we have. We've been talking with Bryce Bott about Philip Yancey's helpfully honest book, Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? Uh, Bryce, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate you for inviting me in. Yeah, and no problem. For those who pick up the book, hope you enjoy it. For sure. Well, we really hope you enjoyed our conversation. Uh, if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to Orchard Hill Plus for more podcasts from Orchard Hill Church. If you really like this episode, we'd love for you to tell us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or if you're watching on YouTube by leaving a, a comment. This really does help people find this, this uh, podcast platform, and it would, really would be a big help to us. Uh, please join us in October for our next episode. This has been Best Books. Until next time.